بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآل الطيبين One of the qualities of action is ربوبية Allah سبحانه وتعالى is رب and we are marbub. He is rab, we are marbub. He is our Lord. What does it mean, rab? Rab is the one who is in charge, the one who runs, the one who manages. It's the meaning of rab. In Arabic, they say, to the women, you know, who are housewife, you know, who are in charge of house, they call them Rabbatuddar. Means she's in charge of the house. This doesn't mean that she has created the house. It means that she is in charge. She decides about, you know, where things should be, you know, when should things happen. Uh, you know, the story of Abdul Muttalib, when Abraham attacked Mecca, outside Mecca he found camels of people like Abdul Muttalib. And he confiscated the camels of Abdul Muttalib. They had set up their tents outside Mecca before they attacked Mecca. So according to a very well-known story, Hazrat Abdul Muttalib went to see him. Abraham saw him with such charismatic you know, appearance. He was very impressed. So Abdul Muttalib just asked him to release his camels. Abraham said, with such you know, charisma that you have, I thought you have come here to ask me not to attack, not to destroy Kaaba, because he was the patron of Kaaba as well. So he said, Ana Rabbul Ibil Walil Bayt Rabbum. I am the Lord of my camels. I am in charge of my camels. Not that I am the creator or the owner. It means that I am responsible for my camels. I am in charge of them. I have to look after them. But this house has its own lord. I am not the lord of this house. It's a very important, very important statement. Because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Kaaba at that time. But throughout history, there were many other times that Kaaba was not saved. So Abraham could have said, if he knew future, that this doesn't mean that Kaaba is not going to be destroyed. Although he has, it has its own Lord, it will be destroyed. So still you should have made some efforts to save Kaaba. But I think, in some uh, courses we had, uh, I have explained this further. I think it's not only the reality which counts. For sure, Allah is the Lord of the Kaaba. But this is not enough. It's important whether we trust Him or not. If someone like Abdul Muttalib is looking after Kaaba, who trusts Allah 100%, and he thinks that he's nothing, and everything you know, depends on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah will save Kaaba. But if we are in charge of Kaaba, and we think that we are really saving Kaaba, 
then Allah says, okay, go and save Kaaba. And then you would see the Kaaba will be destroyed. This is a very important point. You have to find out what is exactly your role. For example, you know, we are very worried about Islam as religious people, as religious leaders, as you know, ulama. We are all concerned. But we should know that we are not lord of religion. We are not in charge of this religion. We are at most just servants. Okay? We do our best, but we know that success comes from Allah. Allah is able to save his religion. So I am not able to save Islam. Who am I? I cannot even save myself. Okay? If with this trust and humbleness we work for Islam, be 100% sure that Islam will be saved. Not by us, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if we think that we are guardians of Islam and we are saving Islam, Islam will be destroyed. Okay? So, he said, Ana Rabbul Ibir, Walal Bayt Rabbu. I am only in charge of my camels. So, Rabb means to be in charge. When it comes to theology, when we say Allah is Rabb, it means that He is in control and in charge of this world. Everything that happens in this world is run by him, is managed by him. It can be related to takvin or tashri'. <coughs> takvin means creation or generation. Tashri' means legislation or making law. So we have Ar-Rububiyya, At-Takwiniyya, we have Ar-Rububiyya, At-Tashri'iyya, generative and legislative. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives life or takes away life. This is part of his Rububiyya because his Rab, our life comes from him, our death also is in his hand. Because his Rab, Rizq comes from him. Health is from him. Okay? Birth is from him. Success, everything is from him. Because he's only one rap that we have. Also, legislation, Tashri. It means that he guides us, he sends prophets, he sends books, he commands to do this thing or not to do this thing. All these are different aspects of his legislative lordship. Of course, there is a difference. Uh, who can tell me the difference? Between the scope of Arububiyya to Takwiniyya and Arububiyya to Tashriya. The scope of generative lordship is different from the scope of legislative lordship. Yes. Legislative, I think, it's when it is in relation to the uh, his relation to the creation and as well creation in relation to each other. And taqwinia is um, the relation to uh, to everything. You can, maybe someone can add more. Legislative needs to be followed for it to happen, but generative happens regardless of whether you... Yeah, yeah, no, I'm talking about the scope. Time, time, like framework. The scope means uh, to what type of beings they apply. The first one is universal, it's for all the creatures. Ah, yes. The second one is just for those uh, who are by intelligence and free will. Yes. Uh. So, 
الربوبية التكوينية belongs to everything الربوبية تشريع only for some beings and that is those beings which have intelligence and choice legislation is not for animals legislation is not for plants legislation is not even for angels Legislation is human for human beings and gens. Because gens also have choice. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Yeah? So, legislation is limited to intelligent beings which have choice. But taquin is everything, including everything. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in charge of everything which happens in the creation from giving existence, giving life, you know, causing death, sustenance, birth, success, everything. And also he's in charge of legislation. Yes. Do you rules like gravity and things that fall into the legislative? No, gravity is generation. Anything which happens in nature is... There is very important point mentioned in the book. Very important. Who can be the Lord of this world? It is only the creator of this world who can be the Lord. Because if your mind is not trained philosophically and theologically, you think that these are two separate things, creating and managing. Because this is the way we do things. Someone creates something, but maybe another person comes and runs it. Yeah? You create a machine, another person comes and uses it. Or runs it. You create an, uh, a business, another person comes and takes over. Yeah? But in existence, in taqween, you cannot do anything unless you are the creator of these things. It's not that Allah creates, then someone else comes from outside and runs it. Who can give life or death or, you know, sustenance or success or whatever? The Creator. So, Rububiyyah cannot be separated from Khaliqiyyah. Lordship cannot be separated from Creatorship. Okay? In the same way, who can legislate? Who can tell us what to do and what not to do? Who can claim our obedience? Only the one who has created us. I cannot, you know, expect from someone who is created by God to obey me. He says, everything that I have comes from God. Why I should obey you? Yeah? Amir al-Mu'mani said, لا تكون عبد غيرك قد جعلك الله حرة don't be a slave of someone else. Allah has created you free. No person, no being other than my creator has the right to be obeyed. Okay? And has certainly no right to be worshipped. Because worship is even higher than obedience. What is the difference between obedience and worship? What is the difference between ta'ah and ibadah? A child is obedient to their parent, as in they listen to their instructions and they trust in them, whereas ibadah is assuming he is God. 
all the sustenance for him. So worship the one who gives you food. Yeah, but, but for example, what is the difference between obeying Allah and worshiping Allah? What is the difference between ta'ah and obudiyah? Worship is part of obedience as well. Yes. So what is the other part? If it is part of it, so what is the other part? The other part is that you direct yourself completely towards your creation. And, and all your mind and your feelings towards him. Yeah. Is worship on the lines of recognizing the Lord as your creator, glorifying his name and in obedience? No, for example, someone is worshiping an idol. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Because worship can be also for false objects. But when they worship idols, they didn't necessarily believe that they are created by them. They, they need, they'll get them there. Indeed, you know, Allah says, مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ يَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ They believe that Creator is Allah, but they still they worship idols. <laughs> Praising something. Pardon? Praising a God, either it's an idol or it's a law. To praise is not uh, to worship. Submission. <laughs> what does it mean, sub? When, when you are worshiping God, it means that So what does it mean if someone worships a statue? They think that the statue is in charge of everything. In charge of everything? Not everything, because sometimes they thought it's in charge of rain. Or in charge of sustenance. Yeah. yeah. Certainly, as you said, obedience is required in ibadah, in worshiping or serving. Okay? If you don't obey, you are not worshiping. Okay? It is said that when Allah said to angels that they should prostrate before Adam, Iblis who was not an angel, but because was with angels, he was supposed also to do sajda. It is said that Iblis said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please exempt me from this, and I will do such ibadah for you, that you know, no one has ever done this. Exempt me from this, whatever else you want, I will do it. Then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to this narration, said, You want to worship me in the way that you choose? This doesn't make sense. Because to worship, to serve, means to obey without questioning, with full <coughs> submission, full obedience. If I say, I obey you when, then I mention some conditions, some criteria. So it means that I am not worshiping i am deciding for myself when it suits me i worship i listen or i obey otherwise i don't so it's not ibadah ibadah means full obedience without questioning without asking without saying in this circumstance i accept in that circumstance i don't this ibadah means full obedience Of course, it is also related to 
the way you think the role of that side or that party is. Normally, we have such full submission and obedience to something that we believe it has a role in this creation. Either it's our creator or it has some role in doing something for me. For example, I think my rest is coming from him. My success is coming from him. If I have one children, it comes from him. Or as the pagans used to say, they thought if they want to get nearer to Allah, this is the way. They have to worship idols to get closer to Allah. Okay? So they believe that they are some transcendent, some supernatural beings that by listening to them, by fully submitting themselves to them, they will achieve something. So, Ibadah is full obedience, full submission. Okay? So, the only one that people should worship is the one who is the Rabb, who is the Lord. And the only one who is the Lord is the one who is their creator. Because we said, Lord is creator. So, there is no one to be worshipped other than our creator. He has created us and everything else. And everything good comes from him. And we should only listen him, to him and obey him. We should worship him. We should trust him. Because he is the source of everything good. And everything that we have also belongs to him. We owe him everything. On top of this, also he is the one who is not gaining anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absolutely from, from any need. You know, whenever you want to obey to someone, even you know, if it comes to human beings, if there are two people that you want to listen to, even for example, if you want to listen to their medical advice, there are two doctors who give you medical advice. Someone doesn't need to charge people because he's very rich. He doesn't need money. But one of them is in need of money. So then you become worried. <clears throat> this person that is giving me medical advice is a needy person. So maybe he has given me this advice just because he has to charge me. So he has to give me some tablets so that I give him money. Otherwise, if he says you are all right, <laughs> I don't give him money. People don't give money to people who said you are all right. You know? <laughs> or maybe he has taken some money from some factories to prescribe their medicine. Yeah? Or maybe he's in need of popularity. So he is looking after the patients just in order to become... Anyway, you, as soon as... I'm not saying necessarily he is giving bad judgment, but I'm saying as soon as someone has need, you become worried. That maybe that need is interfering. But if someone is needless, then you are sure that he has no selfish you know, business here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that is absolutely free from need. Yeah? So when he tells me to do what? For example, to do this or do that, I'm 100% sure that there is nothing selfish here. There is no ego here. There is no gain for him here. It's only for me. So why I should worship people who are in need? If I want to worship, I worship someone who has no need. Therefore, our ulama say, the bottom line, we are not talking now about kalam, but inshallah, 
in Kalamata we study. But now, in you know this discussion about qualities of God, uh, you say the bottom line for a person to be considered as a believer is to believe that Allah is the only one to be worshipped. This is the bottom line. Why? Because if you believe that he is the creator and not Lord, it's problem. If you believe that he is Lord, but you question his authority, again there is a problem. It's only when you come to this point that you believe that he is creator, he is Lord, and he is the only one to be fully obeyed, then you have reached the bottom line. What was problem with Iblis? Did Iblis deny that God has created everything? No, he didn't have any problem with this. He said, So he believed that God is the creator. Did he deny that God is Lord? No, he said, So he didn't. What was his problem? Uh, his problem was that he didn't believe that he has to 100% obey Allah. He didn't believe that he should only listen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to his own personal choice, personal desire, selfish desire. Okay? So that was the problem of Iblis. So before reaching this point, you haven't achieved enough. So if someone believes that God is creator, but not Lord, it's a problem. If believes that God is Lord, but not the only one to be worshipped, it still is a problem. There is a beautiful point in the book that perhaps this is why the motto of Islam is La ilaha illallah. It's not just La khaliqa illallah. Of course, this is true. La khaliqa illallah. Or La rabba illallah. It is also true. But when you say La ilaha illallah, it means that you have all of them inside this. But you have also something extra. So if someone says la ilaha illallah wholeheartedly, it means that he has achieved enough of understanding about the relation between us and God. La ilaha illallah means there is no one to be worshipped other than Allah. There is an analysis here in the book. What does ilah mean? You know, there are lots of discussions about ilah. What is mentioned in the book is that Elah comes from Alaha, which means to worship. Elah is Fa'al. Fa'al, like Kitab. Kataba Yaktubu. Kitab. What does Kitab mean? Something which can be written or is written. Elah means something or someone that can be worshipped. But when we say La ilaha, there is no one to be worshipped, means no one to be truthfully worshipped. No one who has the right to be worshipped. Otherwise, there were other things which were worshipped. Yeah, we are not talking about what happens. Because Many things have been worshipped. We don't want to say no one was worshipped other than God. We want to say no one should be worshipped. No one is worthy of being worshipped other than God. You understand? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there were millions of things which were worshipped and still, you know, people worship idols. People worship their own nafs. But when we say la ilaha means no real Allah. Not false Allah. Yeah? There are lots of false Allah. But the real Allah, the one who should be worshipped, is only 
Allah. What is Allah? Allah is Al Elah. Al Elah means that particular Ma'bu, that particular one who should be worshipped. And then for the repetition of usage, it was so much used, it became Allah. Al Elah became Allah. We call it Takhfif. To make it more simple, it became Allah. So, the only time that our understanding of Tawheed reaches the bottom line is when we believe that La ilaha illallah. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to say, "Qulu La ilaha illallah." But Gulu in an honest way. You know? It means you believe in this. You know, the pagans didn't want to say La ilaha illallah. Why? Why they didn't want to say La ilaha illallah? <coughs> Pardon? Yes. Because they had different Allah and also they were honest. <laughs> today we say la ilaha illallah and we are not honest because today we have different Allah. <laughs> but those people were honest. They said, no, we don't say la ilaha illallah because we cannot commit ourselves to one God. Over history, people have learned. Oh, we say one million times la ilaha illallah and we do the same thing. This is the problem. So, if someone wholeheartedly says la ilaha illallah, okay, not just you know, my lips. It means that you believe Allah has created you and everything and Allah is running this world. Money, rest, success, everything comes from Him. Yes? Then you don't do mischief. If success comes from Him, if rest comes from Him, if position comes from Him, then why I should do mischief? Why I should, you know, try to please you know people instead of Allah yes for the sake of Allah we try to please people but not to please people by making Allah angry so this is the problem Imam Reza alayhi salam you know quoted this hadith kalimatu la ilaha illallah hisni faman dakhala hisni amina what does it mean Kalimatu la ilaha illallah hisni. What is your impression? Hisni is like a fortress. Fortress. That you have a, since that word goes into this fortress, but where the whistle will be shut. And it's safe from the harm of anyone outside of the fortress. Yeah. It means that if someone really wholeheartedly believes in Tawheed, nothing bad can affect him. Shaitan has no way to reach this person. Because this person is mukhless, <coughs> has purified himself for God. It's not that he is in my fortress and still he can do some bad things, some sins, you know. No. When he is in my fortress, it means that he will not do any bad thing. He is safe and immune from attacks of shaitan and from nafsa ammare. If someone wholeheartedly... And you know, even shaitan said this. Those who are mukhlas, they are in the fortress of Allah. So no one can misguide them. No one can, you know, harm them. So, La ilaha illallah is the motto of Islam. Something for people to begin with and something for people to end with. Okay? So, all our life <coughs> is like the ladder to see how much we have gone higher in implementing La ilaha illallah. 
And hopefully, inshallah, before we die, we would be able to wholeheartedly say la ilaha illallah. So let me stop and then we can have questions. Uh, inshallah, we will continue uh, our uh, lecture with lesson 11. So we finish, alhamdulillah, lesson 10. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah, rabbil alam. Allah, 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 Allah,